On this episode of China Unscripted, a British investigator thrown into Chinese prison on trumped up charges, and why no one is safe in China. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. Joining us today is Peter Humphrey, who, if you're not familiar with him, has an incredible story. Uh, he has 45 years of experience with China and was the founder of China Wise, a risk management consultancy firm which specialized in China fraud prevention for corporate clients before it eventually got shut down. So thanks for joining us today. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, well, I appreciate you being on the show because I know this is a, a very difficult subject for you. Yeah. yeah. Well, so for those uh, listening who don't know your story, uh, you're a British citizen a former journalist and a private investigator, but you ended up imprisoned in China. How did that happen? Well, <clears throat> I was in the investigation business doing due diligence and, and anti-fraud investigation for about 15 years. Um, but the final 10 years of that was running my own company called China Wise. For 10 years, uh, we had no problems with the authorities. Um, and we didn't have clients who kind of let us down by, you know, leaking information about the work that we were doing for them until the 10th year. And then we were engaged by GlaxoSmithKline to investigate uh, somebody who they evidently thought was um, a, a whistleblower of some sort. And that's that's a major uh, UK pharmaceutical, correct? Yes, it's a it's an Anglo-American. It's listed on both sides of the Atlantic. Hmm. Um, and so we were investigating for them a former employee who had <clears throat> been pushed out of the company and they believed that she was orchestrating a smear campaign. And after we completed our investigation into her, um, somehow they allowed our report on her to fall into the hands of the Chinese authorities and, and uh, into her hands. And uh, um, she then used her contacts within um, the Chinese PSB organizations and political bodies in Beijing to have us arrested and thrown in jail. Um, for violating her privacy. And so you were, you, how long were you detained for? We were detained for just under two years. Um, for the first year, we were in a pretrial detention center in a cell with uh, no furniture. Um, we being me and my wife in separate cells. She was in the women's block and I was in the men's block. And these cells had about 12 prisoners in a space of 15 square meters and no furniture. You slept on the floor, you sat on the floor, you ate on the floor. You went to the toilet in a hole in the corner of the room and, and uh, we were there for a, a year and then they put us um, on trial all of a sudden. And of course, the inevitable happened. Like everybody else who goes on trial in China, we were convicted. We were convicted of illegally obtaining personal information. And uh, then we were sent off to, to prisons. I was in Qingpu prison, which is a men's prison on the outskirts of Shanghai. And my wife was in Shanghai women's prison. Um, and we were finally released after a total of 23 months in captivity or 700 days. Um, uh, we were released um, amid a, a press campaign in the West of the fact that I'd, I'd had cancer, developed cancer in captivity um, as a result of being denied uh, the medical investigations that I needed. Um, they were trying to use the medical needs, my medical needs, as a weapon to try and extort the confession from me, something I never gave them. Um, even after we were convicted, they were still trying to get me to sign a confession. Um, and uh, up until the last day when we were released, released and put on a plane, they were still asking us to sign this confession. But basically, they withheld medical treatment from me. Um, and as a result, um, I developed prostate cancer. It was in an advanced, an advanced state uh, when I was released in June 2000. And, 15, and I ended up having it properly diagnosed, and, and I was under treatment for the best part of two years. Um, they brought it down, and unfortunately, recently, my cancer has started. Oh, God, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, so you said they wanted you to sign a confession or make a confession. What was that confession? In the context of a Chinese prison, um, they tried to get every prisoner to sign what they call an admission of guilt, Ransui Shu. Um, basically to, conf to confirm the dodgy um, sentence and, and, and court proceedings that you've just been through. They also ask you to, to, to write and sign a repentance report. 
and they ask you to do these things on a weekly basis. So it's a bit like, you know, it's, it's, it's the old, old Chinese Communist Party thought report system. Um, and um, in fact, when they ask, w w when you arrive at a prison, the first thing the senior officer says to you, uh, what are your thoughts? And what they mean by that cryptic question, what are your thoughts? Are you going to confess? That's basically it. So the whole mission of the prison is to confirm that you confess your guilt and so forth in order to justify the sham uh, judicial proceedings that they've just perpetrated on you. And I was constantly under pressure from the warder, the officer in charge of my cell group um, to do this. He was harassing me almost every day of the week. And I was asking for medical investigations. And he was saying, not until you've, um, you've signed the confession. And I complained to this. Uh, uh, I complained about this to my consular officers in the UK consulate in Shanghai. They did lobby for me. Um, the one thing that consuls do for prisoners um, is they lobby for the welfare and the health um, of their citizen who's in a Chinese jail. Um, and they lobbied. But basically, the Chinese uh, prison authorities ignored them. And, and um, the officers in my prison ignored my demands uh, for treatment. Because I actually knew that I had a prostate, a suspect prostate uh, problem when I was arrested. And from day one, I mentioned this, and they, this was withheld from me all the time. What would have happened if you had signed their confession? Was it like a promise that you might get out sooner, or would that have just meant you'd be stuck there longer? Well, <clears throat> that's a good question, because it, it touches on the other important aspect of what the confession can do for you, um, apart from securing medical treatment. Um, you cannot become eligible to apply for sentence reductions based on good behavior if you haven't signed a confession. They won't even tell you the rules and the further steps that you need to take to earn remission points if you haven't signed a confession. So I was never going to be eligible for a sentence reduction, and I knew the length of my sentence was two and a half years. So I just, I just said no. I said, you know, I'm not going to um, confess to crimes I've never committed. I'm not going to make a false confession. And I know that means I cannot earn early reduction. So I'm sorry, I'm going to stay here until the end of my sentence. Until my sentence expires, I'm staying here and there's nothing you can do about it unless you kick me out. So when you said that you didn't want to confess to a crime you hadn't committed, in your understanding of um, the charges against you, was it kind of trumped up because of political reasons, like somebody had, you know, re like relationships with the security services that they could get this charge put against you? Or was there something else going on? First of all, it was a revenge attack by an individual, an individual with very powerful connections, or as the Chinese say, guanxi. Um, this individual was the former employee of GlaxoSmithKline, who we had investigated. She had, she had somehow gotten hold of our report about her. She was angry, um, and she used her connections in the Shanghai PSB apparatus and in the Politburo in Beijing to have us arrested. Um, so it was a personal revenge attack. And it's quite clear to most people who study uh, Chinese criminal prosecution cases that basically every criminal case in China is conducted with that kind of element in it. You know, um, criminal prosecution cases invariably go the way of an accuser who has powerful connections. Um, it's not transparent. Um, you're not in an impartial uh, court facing a, an independent and impartial judge. Everything is controlled and influenced by the Communist Party. If you consider uh, the, the judiciary, the prosecution, um, the law profession, um, the police, um, the prison, the pretrial detention centers are all part of the same stable, all part of the same family, the Communist Party. So, you know, once someone has been accused by a person with that kind of leverage, they don't have a chance in hell. Um, so I wouldn't call it political in the same sense as the political nature of a dissident's trial. Um, but actually, you hit a, a very important point, because I think even criminal prosecutions in China for things that you and I might consider to be ordinary crimes, 
become political the moment that charges are filed against a detainee. Because a communist party governed system can never make mistakes. It can never allow itself to be seen to make mistakes. So once formal charges have been laid against anybody, um, it's political immediately then because all officials and stakeholders in the process of, of, of arrest, detainment, prosecution, uh, conviction, all of the stakeholders um, must not be seen to allow the system to make a mistake. So it is political in that sense. And this is, I think, an untapped area of human rights uh, endeavor in China is the, is, is the area of criminal convictions for non-political crimes. Those cases are also political in this sense because the system is not independent. There is no separation of powers. I believe Chinese courts have a 99% conviction rate. That's right. And appeals have a 99% fail rate. Hmm. How about that? Perfectly balanced. Um, so I'm curious, you know, you spent about two years in horrible conditions. You were treated terribly. How did you resist the temptation to sign that confession? Well, you know, all my life, you know, I've been a, a fighter for justice, a believer in justice and in human rights and human dignity. And, you know, I spent a couple of years as a teacher and then 20 years as a journalist and then 15 years doing this due diligence work. And that's a common thread that runs through my life is, you know, I, I believe in those things. And, uh, you know, as a journalist, you think that you're kind of doing good for the world. Uh, I, I always believed that. And as a due diligence consultant, I also thought I was doing good for the world because I was helping companies and individuals avoid um, distress or to get out of distress. And um, so I always believed in these things. It's part of my life. And, and um, I always taught these things as well to my peers and colleagues. So, you know, I'm not the kind of person who would give in and surrender or sell those values um, in order just to get myself out of jail quickly. Um, that's not me. And, and uh, even though I was ill, that wasn't me. Now, towards the end, you know, a few months before my release, one of my senior consular representatives came to see me. Um, it was an emergency visit because um, I, had, I had actually got confirmation that I had a tumour. And he was trying to suggest to me, well, maybe can't you just roll over a little bit and sign something and, and, and then get out of here earlier and get, get sorted? Um, and I said, no. I said, I'm never going to sign a confession uh, to a crime I didn't commit, even if it means I have to you know, gamble with my health a bit longer. Um, so it's just really the deeply rooted sense of, of what's right and what's wrong that kept me from signing that profit, signing a confession. You know, considering what's happening in Hong Kong right now, I wish uh, more people in the UK government uh, had your attitude of not rolling over for the Chinese Communist Party. Well, I certainly feel the same way. I mean, I think <clears throat> Hong Kong has been, you know, thrown to the wolves in a way back in 1997. Um, but um, I also think that, you know, it happened at a time when um, there was hope, you know, because it, you had a, an ostensibly enlightened, relatively speaking, Chinese leader in Deng Xiaoping. Um, I know, of course, um, you know, he, 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 he was behind the Tiananmen crackdown, but things were improving um, in China in the early 90s. He wasn't Mao. He wasn't Mao. He wasn't the vicious as, as a dictator that Mao was. And, you know, you know, and with people like Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao coming up the ladder, um, and eventually becoming leaders, you know, we got to feel that, that China was becoming a, a friendlier, cuddlier place. I say we in a kind of general collective sense around the world. Um, of course, there were still some very, you know, sober and keen eyed um, China analysts who didn't quite see things that way. But so by the time we got to the handover of 1997, um, we didn't really think things could get very, very bad again with a dictator in China and so forth. The same kind of we. Um, and of course, they did because, you know, along came, once the Deng's kind of um, deathbed wishes had expired, along comes a leader with a different style and different type of ambitions 
who wants to make make himself dictator for life um, again. And that's just simply sent China reeling backwards for the last um, 10 years, uh, reeling backwards and you know, rolling back the reforms that had been carried out in the preceding couple of decades. And, and now that is impacting Hong Kong in ways that Hong Kong people certainly never wished for, probably Chris Patton never wished for. Um, but it's inevitable, I think, that so long as you have a one-party state ruled by a one-man sort of dictatorship, which we now have again in China, um, things will have to fall apart, probably, um, in a rather chaotic and possibly even bloody way um, before they get better again. And, and um, that's where we are now. I mean, Hong Kong is in dire straits, but actually the whole of mainland China is, is in dire straits too. Things are getting worse and worse every month in China under Xi Jinping. Now, with all of your, you know, experience in China previous to your arrest, did you ever imagine that that could happen to you? It's an interesting question because, you know, um, I remember during my years as a as a as a, um, a fraud investigator, when I met people at business networking events, sometimes some someone would say to me, "Don't you think you're afraid? Uh, aren't you afraid that something will happen to you?" Um, you make enemies by doing this kind of thing. And I took the view, well, you know, like a man falling from the top of a multi-story building, he passes each window and he says, so far, so good, so far, so good, so far, so good. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, it was like that. And the key thing was that, you know, I never had a client who behaved irresponsibly and delinquently towards me and towards my business until... 2013 with GSK, because GSK lied, GlaxoSmithKline lied to us about um, the reasons and the nature of, of the assignment they were asking us to carry out. Um, basically, afterwards, it became clear that there were very, very serious criminal bribery allegations being made against the company, which they had concealed from us at the time of engaging us. And that the person we were investigating was someone who they believed was like a kind of informer or troublemaker, whistleblower. Um, and they evidently hoped to use whatever we found out about her in leverage to neutralize her as a whistleblower. And we didn't know that until after um, we had completed our investigation into her. And then suddenly stories started to appear in the Wall Street Journal about um, GSK being investigated in a bribery scandal. So, you know, I guess I was too trustful of my clients, you know, um, and I had actually worked um, as the same kind of service provider for GSK 10 years earlier when I was working for one of the big audit firms. And um, uh, before I started my own firm, we had investigated Glaxo's and client uh, out of PwC and we had been investigating a similar kind of bribery situation to the one that occurred uh, during the, the year of my arrest. Um, and I had, you know, that was 10 years earlier. Um, and this time, GSK was my client. It wasn't P PwC's client. Um, and I had actually no reason to believe or to, to believe that there was any monkey business going on behind this assignment, you know, I, I took them on trust. I took them at face value. Um, but they actually concealed the real drivers of this investigation from me. You know, a major pharmaceutical being less than honest, I just can't imagine. <laughs> well, you know, they're not the only ones to do this kind of thing, I guess. Uh, but um, this is what happened. And, and um, um, so that's why, you know, I never really expected this to happen to me because every year that nothing happened, you feel more com confident. So 10 years of China-wise, um, nothing happens. And then suddenly it happens because you've got a dishonest client. Well, so I guess this brings us to today. Um, you've issued a complaint against the appointment of James Chow, uh, a, well, I use the term very, very lightly, a journalist for Chinese state-run media, CCTV. Uh, he's been appointed as a goodwill ambassador to the World Health Organization. Uh, so why is this a problem? Okay. Um, well, first of all, before the James Chow element 
came into the public limelight here. Um, I had filed two complaints with Ofcom, which is the UK broadcasting regulator in London. Mm -hmm. um, they enforce the UK broadcasting laws on standards of content and privacy, fairness, and all these kind of things. So I filed a complaint in November 2018 against China's television outlets, CCTV and CGTN, for their role in extracting and broadcasting on UK airwaves, not just China's, uh, a so-called confession from me, which is a forced confession. Um, and I was taking advice from an NGO that specializes now in, in, in this whole problem, problem of, of forced confessions on television. So this complaint was an un unprecedented complaint. It was the first time I really believed that um, an individual anywhere in the world had filed some kind of legal action against an arm of the Chinese Communist Party outside China. Um, but it was also in the UK the first time anyone had filed such a complaint against Chinese television. And this complaint is now 18 months old. And um, it took them six months to announce that they were going to investigate it, which is completely, you know, uh, abnormal, hmm. you know, by, by Ofcom's own standards and guidelines and deadlines. And then they received a response from the Chinese side in July last year. And it's now taken another five, where are we, nine months before they actually reach their finding on this uh, complaint. And um, that is unprecedented that Ofcom takes so long. And I'm afraid that, that you know, people are thinking already that there may have been some attempted political influence. Someone might have been leaning on, Lof on Ofcom and so forth. But um, although I can't disclose by Ofcom's rules, I cannot disclose the contents of their correspondence with me. I mean, I can say that we've now reached that milestone um, where Ofcom has has um, has reached its findings, and I received a report on those findings um, this week. And although I still cannot reveal the contents of this finding, um, because both sides still have an opportunity to um, make further presentations of um, uh, or to challenge Ofcom's findings, what I can say, no more than that, and I hope you won't push me to say more, is that when I read this report. I smiled for the first time in 18 months. Hmm. Um, I have a second report, a second uh, complaint standing against uh, CGTN with Ofcom concerning a broadcast that they aired uh, around Christmas, where they devoted half an hour to a personal attack on me. Um, but the, the, the point why this is connected, why these Ofcom complaints are connected with the James Chow WHO affair are, the, are this. James Chow was the anchor at CDTN who packaged, twisted, distorted, and broadcast this forced confession on CDTN's programs in 2013 and the second time in 2014. And um, these were broadcast on UK airwaves and US airwaves as well as Chinese airwaves. Um, and for this reason, um, the organization Safeguard Defenders, which is taking a strong interest in enforced confessions in China, filed a complaint to the WHO in February, um, uh, complaining about the fact that James Chow is a goodwill ambassador. He was first appointed in 2000, 2016 by Margaret Chan, and later reappointed twice, I believe, by Tedros, um, the current WHO head. So. This is somebody who packaged the product of forced confessions where I was placed in a cage, a steel cage, in handcuffs, locked in a metal chair with a locking bar, cameras pointed through the bars of this cage while a policeman pretended to be a journalist and read out questions to me more than once in most cases because I didn't give the right answer that he was looking for. I was drugged at the time. I was in this cage in, in, in uh, August 2013. And I never saw the broadcasts until after my release two years later. I didn't know what they'd done with them. And, and when I, you know, I, I found that they'd cut and paste. They had deliberately mistranslated some of the things I said with 
overlaid narrative and so forth, or or dubbing that was mistranslation, or subtitles that was mistranslation, making it look as though I was confessing to a crime. And I wasn't. Everything that I said was couched with ifs and buts and, and, and you know, if, if I've done something wrong, uh, if I've broken Chinese law, I'm sorry. But, so he's the guy who packaged this for CCTV's international services in English. Um, and he is now and has been for four, over four years a goodwill ambassador um, to the WHO. So Safeguard Defenders filed this complaint in February. And as you know, you know, there is a lot of controversy about WHO's relationship with China, which is coming to the fore at the moment because of um, the way the WHO and China have both handled um, the COVID-19 virus epidemic. And, um, you know, another thing that's come to the fore is that not only is James Chow a goodwill ambassador for WHO, but Xi Jinping's wife, Feng Liyuan, is also a goodwill ambassador, you know, a major general from the People's Liberation Army dance troop. You know? um, I mean, it makes sense. After the Tiananmen Square massacre, she sang to the soldiers, so she really has a way with uh, <laughs> goodwill. I, I don't know. I must say, I've, no, I've never heard her sing, but um, um, so this is what this is about. You know, it's based on the WHO's own code of ethics. The things that he has done in those broadcasts make him disqualified to work for the WHO. And, you know, since then, you know, he left, I think he left um, TV full time two years ago, but he's still a contributor. Um, and he, since then, he, he writes very, very sort of propagandist type of articles defending China, most recently defending China against its handling of the epidemic. And so he's not neutral by any means. He's, 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 he's a servant of the Chinese Communist Party and the police state. He's an agent of influence, um, trying to influence world opinion in China's favor. Uh, there's no neutrality there, and therefore, you know, I don't think he should be in that position. Um, it was Safeguard Defenders who who um, filed this complaint, but with my case at the core of the complaint. Have you heard anything about the complaint since it was filed in February? Since this complaint was filed in February to WHO, WHO has not responded. It has not even sent a brief message saying, we have received your complaint and we're looking into it. Um, not a thing. And as far as I know, the head of Safeguard Defenders, Peter Dalin, has sent a couple of uh, messages uh, following up, asking them what they're doing about this complaint. And he has received nothing in return. Now, the complaint was addressed to... Anyway, five or six uh, senior level people at the WHO, including Tedros. Um, and the others were like heads of various related departments, such as the Department of Ethics and so forth. Um, and not a single person on the recipient list has replied. I think that is why um, uh, Newsweek came out with this article this week, and it's why Peter Darlin submitted a um, a news release update to, to the media earlier this week um, because given the controversy over WHO's relationship with China, um, this matter of James Chow is a very important issue and a test of whether the WHO believes in ethics or not. Well, I, I, I just have to say, uh, recently the YouTube CEO, Susan Wojcicki, said uh, not to have any content on YouTube, uh, you know, going against the guidelines of the WHO. So unfortunately, we're going to have to cut everything you said that was critical of the WHO. It's, uh, you know, it's very important that people listen to the WHO. They are not bought off. Thank you. <laughs> Is that your forced confession? That's my forced confession. I gave in super quick. Um, yeah, this is, I mean, it's really like, this is just another example of like how badly subverted the WHO and the United Nations as a whole is when it comes to the Chinese Communist Party. Um, 
But I think there's a really important issue uh, with your story about, uh, you know, CCTV and CGTN. Um, you know, it's Chinese state-run media, but they operate around the world in free countries uh, like the UK, like the United States. And they broadcast, the fact that they broadcast your forced confession in the United States, in the UK, it's, it's insane. But how can, this is what the Chinese Communist Party does. It takes advantage of the free and open society that we live in and to to have their state-run party mouthpiece operate. How can we combat that while still maintaining our, you know, freedom of the press? Okay, well, I mean, this isn't a freedom of the press issue. Um, it's not a freedom of expression issue here because um, it's, you know, it's, it's a case of um, deliberately propagating lies and distortions um, on behalf um, of a party state. And in the UK broadcasting law, there are very clear provisions on content, on fairness, on privacy you know, standards of broadcasting, which are the law. And this is a country under the rule of law, just like America is a country under the rule of law. Um, China is not a country under the rule of law, unfortunately. And CCTV, CGTN, they are owned by a political party. They are controlled by a political party. All editorial content is controlled and edited by a political party. It's a one-party state party. And this is a problem because under UK law, Ofcom shouldn't even issue a license to a broadcaster who is owned and controlled by a political party. And this is a problem that may have occurred because the license was issued before the present day Ofcom was constituted in its present form. And um, so the license kind of predates uh, Ofcom's creation, which is a bit of a problem. But actually what it really means is that Chinese television in the UK, regardless of the content that they've broadcast, hold their license illegally in the first place. Um, so there are legal issues here, which this government has to address. Um, and my complaints about content and fairness are also legal issues, which Ofcom has to address. Um, it's a government owned body, but it's independent and, and it should address these issues. In America, under broadcasting law in America, the formulations are somewhat different, but it's also illegal under American broadcasting law for a broadcaster to broadcast uh, deliberate lies and distortions is the term. And uh, there is absolutely no doubt that this is what CCTV and CGTN do, CGTN in English and CCTV in, in, in Chinese. They broadcast deliberate lies and distortions. So there's a legal issue in the US there um, of them abusing um, their position as broadcasters, licensed to broadcast in the U US and the UK, abusing it. They think that they're flying below the radar. They think they can disregard laws wherever they go because, you know, they're not coming from a country that really has a rule of law. They're coming from a country which implements some kind of so-called law arbitrarily um, in the name of the party. But they think they can disregard law. And so the whole point of these complaints is to make them, not, make them understand that they cannot disregard our laws, that this is our country or your country, uh, Chris, and, and uh, they cannot disregard our laws. You know, I think the, the other stunning issue your story uh, brings up is just how, how badly the UK failed at protecting you. Uh, you know, currently Canada still has two citizens in Chinese detention, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver. What can Western countries do to actually protect their citizens when they are politically imprisoned inside of China? It's very difficult for any any country to protect their citizens when they are um, arrested and detained in China um, for charges like espionage or, or, or political offences, um, because China just won't talk to you about the details. Um, it's very difficult. But with the more general criminal uh, situations, um, there is a lot that can be done. And I think one of the um, main things that can be done is that governments 
can end the policy of not intervening or commenting on the criminal cases. Right now, you know, the US and, and the UK and other countries have a policy of not commenting or trying to intervene on cases which they think have um, unbelievable underpinnings and so forth, or that they're faulty. They just won't do it. And, and I think that is insane because you're not looking at a partner which is a country under the rule of law. You're looking at a partner which is um, a dictatorship. It's not under the rule of law. And you should be defending your citizens against such regimes. Um, but with the case of the two Michaels from Canada, and maybe one or two other cases that we've seen in the past, um, there was very little um, that they could do. But I think in, in, in the political cases, um, there may be some scope for behind the scenes negotiation. Um, it takes time, but you have this case uh, of uh, an American lady, um, what's her name, Phyllis Fun something, <laughs> um, who was detained in a, in a period overlapping with my own detention um, and, and accused of espionage. But eventually, somehow, there was some negotiation behind the scene. Um, but right now, the relationship between China and most Western countries is so poisoned um, that it's very difficult to do anything for anybody. I mean, you look at the example uh, also, not just Canada, but you look at the example of Sweden uh, and how um, China has been trying to bully this small country, you know, um, and, and, and there's, no, there's no chance that that will improve soon. China tried to extradite um, a so-called economic fugitive uh, from, from Sweden last year, and the Swedish Supreme Court blocked this extradition. So they're not likely to be releasing Gui Min Hai from China in a hurry, who, who is a Swedish citizen. Um, so, and, and this poisonous relationship between Sweden and, uh, um, and China finds its counterparts with quite a number of countries on the planet right now, um, Australia, uh, America, UK. Um, and a few others. Um, so I don't think there is much that um, the Western governments um, can do for their citizens, um, which comes to the point, you know, of, you know, think twice before you go to China, before you do business in China and so forth. It isn't as safe as it was 10 years ago or more than 10 years ago. Nobody's safe in China. Well, certainly after your experience, uh, you did obviously did not approach China with uh, the rose-colored goggles that uh, many people do. Have you seen people's views on China change over the years? Yeah. To be more in line with how you view it? You know, over the years, I think I've seen um, a lot of people develop what you just call rose-tinted lenses uh, on China. And we still see that today. I mean, some of the leading figures in some Western chambers of commerce in China, such as the AmCham or the European Chamber, um, seem to be like agents of influence to me. Um, and and there, are mem there are members of the community who've completely swallowed, I mean, the foreign business community in China, they've completely swallowed um, Chinese propaganda. And I think outside China, we see a lot of members of the public become have become more and more influenced by Chinese propaganda. Um, and a lot of mainstream media organizations are influenced by, by China as well. Um, you know, there's a there's a trade-off for advertising revenue uh, for a newspaper and, and so forth, or how many platforms Bloomberg can sell in China or Thomson Reuters can sell in China. There's a trade-off. Um, because China will pressure them into, you know, pulling their punches when it comes to reporting. So yeah, there's been a lot of that going on. But what's been happening most recently, though, in the last couple of years, is that, um, you know, there's one part of the Trump administration's uh, policy which is getting getting things right, and that is the the, the China policy. Um, and admittedly, sometimes. Um, Trump's policy on China, especially a year or two ago, 
wasn't entirely clear. It seemed to gyrate a bit this way and that way, you know, between blowing hot and blowing cold. Um, but it's quite clear now that, you know, his advisors have probably made it very clear to him that, you know, China is indeed um, an enemy of the United States in many ways. Um, and um, it's just simply not possible to continue being taken advantage of in the way that a free and open society such as America's has been taken advantage of by China um, in recent years. It is time to push back and push back very, very firmly. And we see that more and more Americans, for example, are coming round to that view. And it's beginning to happen here and in Germany and one or two other European countries as well, um, certainly in Australia and New Zealand. People have come uh, around to the view, people have, a light has gone on inside their heads and they realise now that China isn't exactly the cuddly panda that they once thought it was. How do you think Boris Johnson has handled China? Boris Johnson hasn't had long as prime minister, so we have to say that to some extent he is untested. But you have to see Boris Johnson's um, handling of China in the context and in the legacy of his two predecessors, um, David Cameron and Theresa May. David Cameron, in my view, was in bed with China. Um, Theresa May wasn't quite sure. Um, you know, she there was some pushback from her over the sort of the golden era of relations thing. But then she kind of gave in a bit, you know, for example, over this um, Chinese involvement in a nuclear power station in, in, in the UK. Um, and, you know, then we kind of got swept up with all the Brexit stuff and and, um, and, and more recently with the virus stuff, um, which has a practi practical dimension, which we cannot escape, um, even though there's obviously a political dimension to it involving China. And I think that Boris Johnson was leaning towards continuing the cosy, kissy relationship with China. But our, our terrible um, impact from the coronavirus in the UK and our experience in dealing with China during this coronavirus has led to an upsurge of um, support for a, a rather more brutal relationship with China. I mean, there are some MPs in the ruling Tory party, Johnson's party, who are now very vocal on this issue and are kind of they're forming something of a force and a formation uh, within the parliamentary Tory party in favour of distancing the UK from China, um, bringing home um, certain supply chain vital companies in the medical field, for example. Um, and he has just announced, I think, or, or at least it's been leaked, that he, he has ordered government departments to prepare a plan for bringing certain businesses home from China. So it, it's a small version of what Trump has been saying to some extent. Um, and um, I think that that is an inevitable wave which is now moving in the UK as well as elsewhere. Well, that definitely seems like a positive sign. <laughs> it's good to have some positive news, isn't it? <laughs> it's It's been, been a long time coming, I'll say <laughs> that. Uh, well, Peter, thank you so much for joining us and, and sharing your story. I know that it's it's got to be difficult to relive that. Mm -hmm. Well, Thank you again for joining us. Uh, take care, and we'll see. We'll see how the coronavirus may or may not change government's views on China. Thanks. Been nice talking to you. Nice talking to you too. Man, can you imagine having that be your story, being thrown into a steel cage and forced into a televised confession that's seen around the world on a communist party propaganda outlet. It reminds me of in 2016, before we did our Pivot to Asia tour, we did like a, a satire video of forced confessions. Oh, that's oh. right. And uh, it was very funny at the time. Now it feels a little less funny. Hmm. I, I, you know, it really struck me what he was saying about how all prosecutions in China are political, mm. in a sense, because once they start the mechanism, they can't back down. Yeah, the idea that, like, since everything is tied to the Communist Party and it can never be wrong, 
Like, w- w- what a crazy legal system that is. Like, y- the courts can't, they have to uh, convict. Well, I think also, I mean, this is the whole rule by law versus the rule of law thing, where if they have, they can find a law. If they want to go after you, they can find a law for it. You know what or I mean? Or make a law. Yeah. And a lot they of don't the, have to make it. Yeah. Sometimes they do, and in China, they can make laws that are retroactive. Oh, yes. Right. That like in the, in the U.S., you, you can't be prosecuted under a, a law that was passed after you committed what the new law says is a crime. Right? Mm-hmm. But do you have an example of that? In China? The retroactive law thing, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um. Okay, so for example, like, uh, let's say you have a, a factory that is violating EPA regulations. Um, you, in a, an EPA regulation that was passed, say, in 2018, any pollution in violation of that law before 2018, you can't be punished for. I wasn't asking for a, a hypothetical. I just meant, did you have an example of a Chinese Law, like somebody who had been prosecuted retroactively. Yes. Um, Stern Hu, the Australian mining executive. Rio uh, Tinto? Was... Rio Tinto. Oh my gosh, it's going way back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Stern Hu was charged with leaking state secrets. Uh, but what he had leaked or what he had, the documents that he had had were at the time public information that then later became, st- you know, classified as state secrets. I feel hmm. like I had read that Peter Humphrey and Stern, who were actually imprisoned in the same prison. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Right. Yeah. That's, I mean, Chinese that... prison is a small world. <laughs> Especially small if your cell is only 150 square feet. That's so small. That's crazy. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's just such a, a horrific situation. And you think about, all the people who are under the system. I mean, even without having to do retroactive laws or things like that, like you have laws that are so broad, like subversion. Yeah. What does that mean? What they're doing with Hong Kong. Well, we don't know exactly what it'll say, but basically, you know, technically maybe even uh, a China uncensored fan meetup in Hong Kong could be considered oh my gosh, you're like right. foreign interference. I was thinking about that this morning. Oh gosh, and I wonder if it applies retroactively. If it, if this passes, if it would be retroactive. I don't think. Do we need to know? take down fan meetup videos to protect our fans? Oh my god, that's a that's a really interesting question that we need to think about. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think that, that what we're going to face with Hong Kong is when, and not even if anymore, but when the CCP basically declares that Hong Kong is fully under the authority of the PRC one government. One country, one system. Yeah. Well, they'll still call it one country, two systems, but it'll be fully under the control of the PRC. Uh, once that happens... Uh, it will go to the mainland system where laws are retroactive. And so anything that Hong Kongers have done between 1997 and 2020. I don't know that's true, actually. I, I'm saying it, it is possible that, that that same system could apply to Hong Kong. Well, I think they can't bring over the entire because Hong Kong still has the common law system. So I don't think they can just because they can force a national security law into the basic law, the Constitution using Annex 3, which is there kind of like always there so that they could put in any type of law related to defense, foreign affairs or anything that's not covered by Hong Kong's internal laws. Mm -hmm. Like that doesn't mean that they can now move over the entire legal system. To you, you you say can, uh, but like no, they'll just have to try to find ways to make things illegal using the laws and using Hong Kong's common law framework that already exists, which they are already doing a good job of. Right, you know, I mean, because they've used it to persecute uh, activists from the 2014 Umbrella Movement, uh, from the the Mong Kok uh, thing in 2016, fishball riots. Uh, I just couldn't remember the name. 
Uh, it's a very memorable name, actually. I, I know. I just, I just, you know, this is the unscripted, Shelly. It's trying to unscript it. If this were scripted, I would have gotten it perfectly right because you would have fact checked it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but then also like the the 2019 stuff, you know, seeing a lot of people who have already been uh, arrested on charges related to, the, to you know, so called rioting. Mm-hmm. First uh, person was sentenced four years for rioting. Right. And, and some of these charges include what were at the time initially approved protests. Uh, and so I'm just saying that like, like, sure, Hong Kong law says, you know, you can't retroactively, you know, prosecute people. But that doesn't mean, but like Hong Kong law also says that the CCP can't just do whatever it wants. But clearly that's actually happening. Like, the Hong Kong law says one thing, and then there's the reality on the ground, which is controlled increasingly by the CCP. So honestly, like, it it will be the case. Oh, we'll see gradually, but in in you know chunks uh, over the next you know six months and five years that the people of Hong Kong will be less safe and less safe and less and less safe. Oh, I mean, not arguing with you there, but I think it is the retroactive law thing. I think is maybe an exaggeration just because like they still have to figure out how to make this work within Hong Kong's legal framework. This is the problem with accuracy, Ninja. I prefer to say that Xi Jinping will personally go into Hong Kong and shoot every single person unless we stop them now. Fact. (laughs) I have to say, Shelly, I really do hope that you're right and I'm wrong about this. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I don't think you're wrong on the big picture. I just think that it's not like immediately everybody will get arrested for things that happened five years ago under the national security law. No, it'll it'll take a little time before they get arrested. Or they'll be arrested on different things that are basically trumped up charges, uh, but for like other things. But really, it's about the thing they did back in, in you know, a previous year. I mean, they don't need the national security law to do that, though. That's, no. That's already happening with the Hong Kong police. So, yeah. I'm, God, I'm really depressed now. Yeah, I mean, I just wonder where, you know, all of, like, the these open letter writers, think tanks, where where are they? Are they writing, are, like, where are they on Hong Kong and Taiwan now? Like, all these people who have been bought off and taken Chinese money, I think. Somebody. A revolution needs to happen. Somebody, uh, I hope you don't mean, like, as in, like, a French revolution type of revolution. This time it will be done correctly, because I'll be in charge. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Uh, somebody actually brought up the, uh, there was like an open letter from last July or something where Mm -hmm. it was kind of about how we need to work with China. China's not our enemy signed by a bunch of academics, think tank people, former politicians, I think, you know, like Susan Thornton and people Mm -hmm. like that. So like, and then in light of what happened in Hong Kong yesterday, they kind of reposted and was like, this did not age Age well. well. Yeah. Well, I mean, in some ways, it's great that all of these people are making it very clear who they are and where their interest lies. Yeah, and and honestly, like, I know that a lot of think tanks and and academics and so on have have looked at China with rose tinted glasses for a long time and accepted Chinese and, money. And but I I really do applaud those people who are who now are looking back and like you know what I was wrong about how I viewed China before, uh, or. You know, it's it's gotten worse, and I acknowledge that. And my view is now that we do need to be aware of the, the problem, the threat from the Chinese Communist Party. And like, there's a lot of reasons why people might not have been right before. Because the, I mean, the, even Peter Humphrey was talking about yeah. how he felt that you know China was getting better. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah all that stuff. So, yeah, but I think we're now getting to the point. With the coronavirus, what's happening in Hong Kong, the military threats to Taiwan, uh, even the the greater transparency about organ harvesting as that's coming out, it's getting to the point where it will, like people will either have to change their stance and like admit they have made mistakes in the past on China. Otherwise, you know, it's getting past to the point of no return, really. Like it won't be possible to, uh, you know, have those those old fake views on China without uh, getting called being called out on it? Yeah, Yeah, I think that's that's true. I mean, I think a lot of the fight is going to be on these, like, nuances, right, where people are like, oh, well, you know, you can't say that all, you know, 
like everything that the Chinese government does is bad and all I this mean, stuff. In my There's going to be a lot of. We just won't deal with nuances. <laughs> Bring out the guillotines. Is that what you're saying? It's the 21st century. I think we can think of something better than a guillotine. Something that's at least easier to spell. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, All right. I think we better end this podcast before we get in trouble with YouTube. I oh, uh, we're already in trouble with YouTube. There's there's no going back on that. That's that's true. All right. Well, thank you for watching. Uh, you know, again, if you want to actually watch the podcast, you can check it out on YouTube. Unless YouTube takes it down, because we are definitely not trying to foment any type of violent revolution. Oh gosh, you're right. Uh, correct. For clarity, that was satire. Satire, yes. <laughs> satire? Yeah, satire. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you can check us out on YouTube or Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes. I heard we were actually trending on iTunes in India this past week. That's so awesome. That's pretty cool. Uh, so, yeah, uh, thanks for listening. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelly John. And I'm Matt Kanesta. Talk to you next time. Oh.